Good morning and welcome to Breakfast News on Rajya Sabha TV. I'm Ashwarya Kapoor. Let us begin with the headlines. Union Cabinet clears 7th Pay Commission recommendations, salaries of 47 lakh central government employees and 52 lakh pensioners to go up at least to 23.5%. Monsoon session to extend from 18th of July to 12th of August, government to push for passage of the crucial constitution amendment bill related to GST. Delhi University's cut-off list touches unrealistic heights, this time two highest cut-off at 99.25% for BCom honours course at Ramjas College. And European Union defines tough terms for Brexit, says free movement for migrants must for access to single market even as Scotland lobbies to stay in EU. Well, the recommendations of uh, the 7th Pay Commission were approved by the Cabinet yesterday. The pay hike will benefit over 1 crore central government employees and pensioners. The Cabinet also gave its nod to the National Mineral Exploration Policy yesterday. पे और पेंशन के संबंध में जो रिकमेंडेशंस पे कमीशन की आई हैं उन रिकमेंडेशंस को बाय लाज सरकार ने स्वीकार किया है और वो रिकमेंडेशन पहली जनवरी 2016 से लागू होंगी दे विल बी इंप्लीमेंटेड विद इफेक्ट फ्रॉम 1 जनवरी 2016 एंड द एरियर्स since we are towards the end of June, would also be paid in this year. This pay commission covers 47 lakh central government employees and 53 lakh pensioners. Government finally gave its nod to the salary hike for central government employees on Wednesday by accepting the recommendation of 7th Pay Commission. However, the recommendation regarding abolition of some allowances will be further examined. Mojuda allowances chalte rahenge jab tak ki ek secretary's committee nay allowances pe jo pay commission ne kaha hai usko adhyan karke uski recommendation suggest nahi karti usme ek samay lagega. Ek dusra group banega ki har pay commission ki report ke baad kuch anomalies aati hain. और अलग अलग कार्डर्स की अपनी अपेक्षाएं होती हैं तो उन अनोमलीज की सुनवाई कोई कर ले और उन अनोमलीज को दूर करने के प्रयास करे जहां तक संभव है गवर्नमेंट हैज सेड दैट अरियर्स विल बी पेड बाय दिस ईयर एंड एन एनुअल बर्डन फॉर पे पेंशन एंड अरियर्स विल बी 1 लाख 2100 करोड़ रुपीस हमने ये नेशनल मिनरल एक्सप्रेशन पॉलिसी नई बनाई है इसके माध्यम से हम अपनी संस्थाओं को भी सुदृढ़ करेंगे रिसर्च को भी आगे बढ़ाएंगे निजी क्षेत्र के लोग एफडीआई आकर्षित हो सके माइनिंग के क्षेत्र में एक्सप्लोरेशन के क्षेत्र में ये इस एक्सप्लोरेशन पॉलिसी के माध्यम से सुनिश्चित होगा और माइनिंग का क्षेत्र आगे बढ़ेगा यह समय की आवश्यकता थी इसलिए रेवेन्यू शेयर मॉडल के आधार पर हम सब लोग इस काम को आगे बढ़ाना चाहते हैं इसलिए इस पॉलिसी की आवश्यकता थी Cabinet also approved four laning of three highway projects in Punjab, Odisha and Maharashtra. This is Vishal Daya's report for Rajya Sabha TV. Well, amid the talks of a cabinet reshuffle in the first week of July, now Prime Minister Narendra Modi will chair a meeting for the Council of Ministers today. The meeting will be attended by Finance Minister Arun Jaitley, BJP President Amit Shah, among other cabinet members. Well, changes to the cabinet are likely to be announced before 6th of July when the Prime Minister leaves for Africa. Well, according to sources, new ministers are likely to be added and some may be given an upgrade as well. The Minister of State, uh, Piyush Goyal and uh, Dharmendra Pradhan may be promoted to the cabinet rank. Piyush Goyal's uh, shift to a more high-profile ministry has been specu speculated upon for months. Well, the reshuffle is also being looked at uh, in the context of the Uttar Pradesh Assembly elections. Even though there might be no change in key ministries, but the state may get more representation.
Well, the cabinet cannot ex exceed 82 ministers. Currently, it has 70 members, including Prime Minister Narendra Modi. A dozen cabinet ministers are from Uttar Pradesh, which votes next year. Well, the monsoon session of parliament is likely to begin from the 18th of next month. The government has recommended the dates for the session to the president. Monsoon Satra. Atara July se Bara August tak. Atara July ko bulane ke liye taya kiya hai. Bre session Bara August tak chalne ka sambhav na hai. वही बहुत जरूरत आए तो इधर दो-तीन दिन आगे भी कर सकते और कम भी कर सकते। The Cabinet Committee on Parliamentary Affairs has recommended these dates for the monsoon session. The session, which is likely to have 20 working days, will see the government pushing for the passage of the crucial constitutional amendment bill related to GST. Finance Minister had in detailed discussion with the finance ministers and chief ministers of the states also. Political parties have been spoken to, and some of their concerns also are addressed. By and large, I am of the view that we have a wider support and we have enough numbers on the GST, but we would like that every party, because it will have effect on the states also, we want, the government want to get the bill passed by a consensus. That is our effort. We are working in that direction. We will be talking to other parties who still have some objections or some suggestions to be added, if any. 56 bills are pending before both the houses, 11 in Lok Sabha and 45 in Rajya Sabha. The government has asked ministries to come with at least 25 new bills for the monsoon session. The government is also likely to push for the passage of three bills, replacing ordinances on the combined entrance exam for medical and dental colleges, as well as the one seeking amendments to the Enemy Property Act. Vishal Dhaya's report for Rajya Sabha TV. Well, on to some other news now. Well, uh, gross bad loans held by banks could touch 8.5% of the total assets next year. What is more, 86% of such loans are being taken by large borrowers. The RBI, however, says that India's financial system is stable, although it does admit that the banking sector is facing significant challenges. Bad loans are crippling the banking sector. The RBI's Financial Stability Report says that from 5.1% in September 2015, gross bad loans of banks jumped to 7.6% in March 2016 and could touch 8.5% by 2017. If there is a drought, then definitely the income, the resources which an industry or a businessman can generate for repayment of the loan and the interest which he is supposed to do when, when he is committed to take and make back the payment to the bank, is in difficulty. The RBI report says much of the risk is concentrated with a few large corporate borrowers, a fact that hugely threatens the banking system. Between September 2015 and March 2016, NPA ratio of large borrowers rose sharply from 7% to 10.6%. Top 100 borrowers alone accounted for 22.3%, a massive jump from just 3.4% in September 2015. The failure of the top two stressed borrowers could itself result in capital losses of 6.9% and 9.4% if the top three stressed borrowers fail. Banks should adopt the more prudent approach while disbursing and sanctioning the loans as well as the RBI has recently suggested the few mechanisms which banks should adopt more cautiously and more willingly such as the CDR mechanism, the SDR mechanism, the, the, the 525 rule. The RBI has submitted to the Supreme Court a list of the big defaulters who failed to repay loans of over 500 crore rupees. But the bank pleaded their names should not be made public because of a confidentiality clause that could impact business. Earlier, a Supreme Court bench headed by Chief Justice T.S. Thakur objected to the prevailing banking atmosphere and noted that big corporate house owners defaulted on loan repayments running into thousands of crores or rupees. Yet, they were enjoying vast amounts of personal wealth. 29 state-run banks wrote off 1.14 lakh crore of bad debts between financial years 2013 and 2015. 
Now, the Reserve Bank of India has set March 2017 as the deadline for the banks to clean up their balance sheets, forcing them to promptly disclose NPAs and take remedial steps. Even capital infusion by the government is seen crucial to shore up state-run banks. Reporting from Delhi, with camera person Sanjay, I'm Kriti Mishra for Rajya Sabha Television. Meanwhile, uh, World Bank President uh, Jim Yong Kim on Wednesday said that India needs to fix the problem of malnutrition and stunting among its younger generation to better compete with the global powers. Now, Kim, who is on a two-day visit to India, visited a Women and Child Development Centre in the national capital where he met children. Kim also assured World Bank's assistance to India in fighting uh, malnutrition among children. He also visited a skills centre in the national capital to view the efforts being made uh, to impart professional skills to the youth of the country. During his visit, Kim will explore knowledge and financial opportunities as well as understand India's efforts on renewable energy and nutrition. Children who are, are, who are low height for age, uh, who are malnourished, often don't have the same kind of neural connections as the children who are the appropriate height and weight for age. But this is something that can be fixed. The message I'm bringing here is that with the great things that are happening in centers like this, we can fix the problem uh, of uh, under height, under, underweight. Uh, the, issue, the word that is used is stunting. Uh, but we can fix this problem here in India, and then India will be prepared to compete with any country in the world. Well, the Delhi University is the first cut-off list for admissions uh, to the 2016-17 academic session was uh, out on Wednesday night. Well, unlike last year, no college listed 100% cut-off in the first list. However, the highest cut-off for the academic session has been announced by Ramjas College at 99.25% for BCom Honours, 98.75% for BCom and 98.5% for Economics Honours. The cutoff for uh, Hansraj College has remained unchanged across the streams uh, with the economist honours being uh, the highest at 98%. Now, SRCC announced its cutoff at 98.25% for economics honours and 98% for BCom honours. Miranda House cutoff uh, for science courses is also the same as the last year with the highest being for economics honours at 97.75%. LSR has announced its uh, cutoff for psychology at 98.5%, English 98.25%, economics 98% uh, and commerce 98%. Uh, However, for the first time, the university saw a dip in the number of applications. The second uh, cutoff list is expected uh, on 2nd of July. And in breakfast news, we'll take a very short uh, break. Up next, we have all the international news and sports news. The sacred relics of Buddha were unearthed in Piprava in Uttar Pradesh. Buddhist monks from all over the world visit the National Museum to pay their respects. These charred bone fragments of Buddha are housed in the gold canopy gifted by the royal family of Thailand. Welcome back after the break. Well, Britain's uh, divorce uh, from the EU is going to be a rocky road if indications from the bloc's two-day meet are anything to go by. Now, there's no clarity on even how to begin the process of uh, disentanglement. Now, Europe is refusing to engage in talks until Article 50 is uh, triggered and also insisting that the UK has to accept the free movement of people to retain access to the single market. Meanwhile, Britain continues to reel under a leadership crisis even as Scotland uh, lobbied in Brussels for a chance to stay in the EU. The two-day Brussels summit to discuss Britain's future after the Brexit vote concluded on Wednesday, with the European leaders saying that they expect Britain to notify them of its intention to leave as early as September by invoking Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty. EU also insisted that the UK has no prospect of keeping access to a single market until it continues to accept EU migration. This was the first time in 40 years that EU had a meeting without Britain. 
Leaders made it crystal clear today, access to the single market requires acceptance of all four freedoms, including the freedom of movement. There will be no single market a la carte. While Europe grapples with the after effects of the UK vote, US President Barack Obama also expressed concern. I think there are some genuine longer term concerns about global growth if in fact Brexit goes through and that freezes the possibilities of investment uh, in Great Britain or in Europe as a whole. Thank Meanwhile, you, outgoing British Prime Minister David Cameron faced the Parliament for the first time since the referendum, delivering a stark message from Brussels on the challenges ahead for the UK. All of the warnings were that if we voted to leave the EU, there would be difficulties in terms of our own economy and growth rates and uh, um, uh, instability in markets. We're seeing those things. We're well prepared for them in terms of the reaction of the Bank of England and the Treasury. But there's no doubt in my mind these are going to be difficult economic times. We voted to the leave. The session also EU. saw fiery there clashes be between Cameron and opposition leader Jeremy Corbyn, who is refusing to resign despite overwhelmingly losing a no confidence vote by Labour MPs. I have to say to the Honourable Gentleman, he talks about job insecurity and my two months to go. It might be in my party's interest for him to sit there. It's not in the national interest. And I would say, for heaven's sake, man, go. While Cameron returned from the corridors of European power, Scottish First Minister Nicola Sturgeon was in Brussels to quote European leaders over Thank ways Scotland could potentially Thank remain in the EU. Uh, since I've been here today, I've found enormous interest in the referendum result as you would expect and I've also had a sympathetic response to the position Scotland now finds itself in facing the prospect of being taken out of the European Union against our will a position not of our making uh, and not one that we wanted. Besides fueling renewed talk of Scottish independence, Britain's shock vote has also sent the pound tumbling, hurt global markets and left a gapping leadership vacuum in the UK. Candidates from the ruling Conservative Party are jockeying to replace Cameron. However, a successor is not expected to be announced until early September. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. While less now, security remains a tight at Istanbul's Ataturk airport, even as the air travel slowly returned to normal. Though passengers crowded at the airport terminal, the sense of fear permeated all. The death toll from the suicide attacks reached 42, with more than 239 others being wounded. Now, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan said that his country is being tested in the face of rising militancy in the region. Even though no group has declared responsibility for the attack so far, Turkish officials believe that Islamic State is responsible. Now, this was the deadliest in a series of suicide bombings this year in Turkey. The government declared a national day of mourning on Wednesday and also lowered flags at public and private institutions across the country to half-mast. Terror olayını üstlenenler konusundaki düşüncemiz ağırlık kazanarak devam ediyor. DAEŞ olduğuna işaret ediyor. Ee, herhalde e, bir iki gün içerisinde çalışmalar tamamlanır. I know that our collective hearts though go out to the families of the latest victims of the horrific terrorist attacks perpetrated as well as incited by ISIL. The despicable attack at Istanbul's international airport yesterday that killed dozens and injured many more certainly bears the hallmarks of ISIL's depravity. Let's get you some more international stories in World Wrap. A black box recording from crashed Egypt air flight MS-804 confirmed a smoke on board. The Egyptian committee investigating the crash said that it has extricated data from the flight recorder, which points at high temperature damage. The second black box, the cockpit recorder, is still being repaired in Paris. Convoy carrying a suspected Islamic State militants has been destroyed in airstrikes near the Iraqi city of Fallujah. An Iraqi security source said that the jihadists had been attempting to flee the offensive by the government forces who recently recaptured the city. 
Earlier this week, the Iraqi government announced that Fallujah was fully under its control after a five-week offensive. The leaders of Turkey and Russia have spoken for the first time since the downing of a Russian military jet by Turkey separated a diplomatic crisis. Vladimir Putin, the Russian president, and the Turkish president Erdogan on Wednesday agreed to meet in person during their first phone call. The call came after Turkey expressed regret to the Russian president and to the family of the pilot killed in the incident. China on Wednesday said that an arbitration court hearing its dispute with the Philippines over the South China Sea had no jurisdiction in the case. Now, China's foreign ministry said that the country would not accept any forced dispute resolution. The court will deliver its decision on 12th of July. And the US President Barack Obama will hit the campaign trail for the first time with presumptive Democratic White House nominee Hillary Clinton next Tuesday in North Carolina. Their debut joint campaign had been scheduled for 15th of June but was postponed due to a mass shooting days earlier in Orlando. Now to some sporting action. Well, despite hit by plenty of rains, it was business as usual at Wimbledon on day three. Well, top seeds Roger Federer and Novak Djokovic entered round three with comfortable wins in their round two contest. While amongst the women, third seed Agnieszka Radwanska also raced to the third round with state sets victory. World number one Novak Djokovic remains on course to defend his Wimbledon title after beating Adrian Mandarino in straight sets to reach round three on Wednesday. Djokovic beat the Frenchman 6-4, 6-3, 7-6 in two hours and four minutes. The 29-year-old Serb now has won 30 successive Grand Slam matches and currently holds all four titles. Djokovic will next face the winner of the match between 28 seed American Sam Querrey and Thomas Bellucci of Brazil. Uh, well, I have to be very grateful to, to, to have the opportunity to make a history of, of the sport and I, of course every single record that, uh, that uh, I managed to, uh, to achieve um, in the last couple of years is... Uh, is important and is 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 unique to to me. So um, uh, every next one that uh, that um, I have a possibility to to achieve is uh, motivation more. So that's that's how I look at it. British qualifier Marcus Willis's remarkable Wimbledon run came to an end with the defeat by seven-time champion Roger Federer on the centre court. Willis, the world number 772, who came through six rounds of qualifying and the first round proper, was beaten 6-0, 6-3, 6-4 in round two. Third seed Federer could play another Britain next as he awaits either Dan Evans or Ukraine's Alexander Dolgopolov. Well, I thought I got my fair share of support, but he deserved more. He deserved more in the bigger moments. He played some great points. Um, he fought hard. He's uh, a great personality for, for a centre court like this. And In the women's draw, world number three Agnieszka Radwanska eased through her rain-delayed first-round match, beating Ukraine's Katrina Kozlova 6-2, 6-1. Radwanska, who reached the final in 2012, has never lost a first-round match on the Wimbledon grass and she kept up that record, sealing victory on her third match point. Well, of course, I was happy. Um, I knew that um, I think three days, it's not uh, uh, good weather right now. So, um, well, I was really lucky to play on the centre today, that's for sure. In the last match of the day, one of the youngest women in the draw, Belinda Bencic, cruised into the second round of Wimbledon, courtesy of a straight sets victory over Bulgarian Svetlana Pirokova. It took the Swiss under 80 minutes to see off her opponent, eventually coming through 6-2, 6-3 to progress in routine fashion. Bureau report, Rajasabhati. 
and to cricket and former skipper Anil Kumble formally took charge as the head coach of the Indian cricket team on Wednesday, days ahead of the team's seven-week tour of the West Indies. Now, interacting with the team, uh, being led by Virat Kohli, Kumble urged the players to inculcate self-belief and also develop themselves as leaders. He said that he was confident uh, that the team would do well during the upcoming tour, where they play a four-test series. As the training camp for the Indian cricket team's West Indies tour began in Bengaluru on Wednesday, the newly appointed head coach of the team, Anil Kumble, interacted with his team for the first time since taking charge. Leading the team into his first assignment to a seven-week tour of the Caribbean, Kumble urged his players to always show fighting spirit. I'd like to observe and, and try and uh, see uh, how the team is uh, shaping up. And uh, you know, at this point in time, I thought that uh, you know, I, uh, with the bowlers, uh, it, it's the strategy that I can certainly play a part of, and and that's something which I'm looking at. You know, trying to get closer to the bowlers and understanding what their needs are. Win or lose, the fighting spirit will always be there. Kumble also exuded confidence of a good tour of the West Indies. The country where he himself displayed exemplary courage on the field back in 2002, bowling with his face heavily bandaged after a bouncer broke his jaw. The last time that India played, like I mentioned, had a successful uh, series. Uh, we won one nil in a three test match uh, series and uh, I think Kishant was the man of the series. So uh, there is you know, experience, uh, he will be the leader uh, you know, to take the bowling attack. And uh, Virat has already played there. Murli Vijay did well on that series. Amit Mishra has played. So there is experience in this team who have uh, experienced those conditions. Obviously, I have been there before, so I will bring in that as well. The former skipper, however, graciously skirted the appointment row involving him and Ravi Shastri, saying the success of the team depends on the players, not on the coach. It's not about Ravi or Anil or whoever it is. It's not about the head coach. It's about the players, it's about the team. And from my point of view, you know, whether it is Ravi, whether it is or whether it's me or whether it's any Indian who's following Indian team, we all want the Indian team to do well. We all want the Indian team to perform at its best. Kumble's appointment ahead of Ravi Shastri had not gone down too well with the former team director. Shastri was the top contender for the job until Kumble became a candidate. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. Well, that's all in this edition of news, but news and updates continue on your channel. Thanks for watching.